Okay, this evening we're going to talk about uh, Tendai and interfaith involvement. And the origins of what might be called the interfaith movement can be traced back to Chicago in 1893 at the Problem of the World Religions. More about that later. It could be reasoned that an interfaith perspective is found in the foundations of Tiantai Tendai School of Buddhism sort of baked into the philosophy and the practices. This presentation is not intended to be a comprehensive examination of interfaith. Rather, it's focusing more upon the origins and how it manifests today with an emphasis, emphasis on why Tendai is involved. So we're gonna start by examining a few terms. And this is not necessarily the most straightforward definition as we'll see in a moment, but it's what we realize happens, at least in upstate New York uh, and many of the groups around the country. The word interfaith is described as an interaction between people of different religions or faith traditions. And interfaith interaction live out core values that are shared by all religious value, by all religions values like compassion, respect, love, hope, and peace. And as I say, the interfaith cooperation is not about renouncing religions or combining all religions <coughs> with one. Many people find that their friendships with people in other traditions strengthen their understanding and respect for their own tradition. In other words, it's about understanding our significant differences, but also recognizing our similarities and working together for peace, justice, and healing in our world. There are organizations such as the New York State Council of Churches and its local affili affiliates, as well as other organizations around North America who would suggest the following. And they would define ecumenical as relations and prayers with, Christ with other Christians, interfaith as relations with members of the Abrahamic faiths, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian traditions, interreligious as relations with other religions such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Jains, Sikhs, etc. In this discussion, I'll be using the terms interfaith and interreligious synonymously. Religious traditions have been involved with each other as long as there have been religious traditions, and some of this is negative and some of this is positive. And I just want to make a, a point here, at least there, when we're dealing with interfaith, it implies, or interreligion, however we want to use the term, it's rather selective, it's rather self-selective, because there are organizations, I know there's certain uh, Christian organizations who, by the nature of their particular practices, will not do anything with other interfaith, with other religions. It's just not part of their, it's written into their, into their code uh, or their canon not to participate which I, I was interested to find that out. And at the same time, I think that when we're dealing with the term interreligious, you'll find some groups who will say it's not a religion if it's not monotheistic, as an example. That's a very, very, let's say, fundamentalist viewpoint, uh, coming from a very fundamentalist viewpoint. It's an ignorant viewpoint. Uh, you know, as, a, as an anthropologist, the definition of religion, you know, you just fulfill 10 out of 20 categories and it's a religion or it's not a religion. It's not, it's sort of you can quantify what is and what isn't. Not to say there aren't qualifications also, but um, so the term interfaith, interreligion is often used interchangeably. And even what is a religion is sometimes uh, a matter of issue for some ignorant people. And I say ignorant people because that's what they amount to. They're not, they're not looking at, at the um, totality of the traditions. Next, please. And so from the perspective of interreligious interactions, we can say that for the most part, many of those were interactions were not good, which is why having interfaith and interreligious inter um, events and contexts are good today because of avoiding that sort of negative uh, situation. An example of interactions that were not very good 
was between 1096 and 1291 were the Crusades. Oh, the Crusades were so exciting. Uh, there were a series of religious wars between Christians and Muslims started primarily to secure control of holy sites, primarily in Jerusalem, in the area now known as, known as Israel and Palestine, which were considered, which are considered sacred to both groups. <coughs> The costly, violent, and often ruthless conflicts enhanced the status of European Christians, making them major players in the fight for land in the Middle East. We can con that, contrast this to the Ottoman Empire, which was one of the largest and longest lasting empires in history, controlling much of Southeast Europe, Western Asia, and Northern Africa between 1299 and 1922. It replaced the Byzantine Empire as the major power of the Eastern Mediterranean. It was an empire inspired and sustained by Islam and Islamic institutions. Non-Muslims, particularly Christians and Jews, were present throughout the empire's history. The Ottoman imperial system was characterized by an intricate combination of official Muslim hegemony over non-Muslims and a wide degree of religious tolerance. While religious minorities were never equal under the law, they were granted recognition, protection, and limited freedoms under both Islamic and Ottoman traditions. And I'll contrast that, for instance, to uh, Spain and Portugal, the Inquisition. If you were not a Catholic, you could be summarily executed, and it, it drove the, the Muslim and the Jewish populations out of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, in the you know 10th century, uh, 10th uh, actually the it would have been the um, well it started really one Inquisition started in the 13th century and the other into the 15th century. Um, next please. So these are just two of the types of interreligious involvement, and let's look at another two types of interaction and closer to what we mean as interfaith or interreligious. And on the, on the left of the two photos, the World Parliament of Religion in Chicago, one taken in 1893 and the other one 100 years later, uh, 30 years ago. This is considered the start of the global interfaith dialogue held in Chicago in conjunction with the Columbian Exposition. The World Parliament of Religions was a milestone in the history of interreligious dialogue. The study of world religions and the impact of Eastern religious traditions on American culture. The Parliament, several delegates from Asia, were among the first authoritative representatives of their traditions to travel to the West. The earliest Vedantists and Buddhist organizations in the United States <sighs> to cater primarily to Westerners can be traced directly or indirectly to this conference and its delegates. Several things I'd like to point out in these pictures. The first is that two Buddhists, one from Sri Lanka, Angrikar Dhammapala, uh, and Shaku Suin, a Zen priest, are often mentioned. However, look at the picture, the black and white picture, and look just left to the of the dais. Uh, there were ten Dai monks who were present at that particular. Uh, Congress performing shomyo and involved in discussions. And so you'll see a Tendai monk right there in the front seat, mm -hmm. just left of the dais. Another thing is a comparison of the photos taken 100 years apart. In 1893, there were no women on the dais, there was whereas one. there were several in the photo taken 100 years later. No women. Say that again, please. No, no, women. No, women. no women on the dais. Uh, in 1893, but in 1993, you can see several women prominent in the front. Now, on the right is a photo of Lao Tzu, Confucius, and Shakyamuni Buddha. And you'll find such a triad quite often, and it's really easy to find the three pictures of them together. Because even though they're the founders of individual religions, religions the interactions of these traditions are so intermeshed that they, are, that they represent... <laughs> what is now often referred to as Chinese religion. Although, to be precise, one would add Chinese vernacular religions to the mix to be most correct. And this is no less true in Japan, uh, at which point one should add Shinto to the Japanese religious formula. So what I would characterize in one way is the Eurocentric view 
of religion that was demonstrated at the Parliament of World Religions. Um, and the Asian view of religion, the Western religions, the Abrahamic traditions are by their nature exclusivist. That is to say, if you're Christian, by definition, you're not going to be Jewish or Muslim um, or and any of those combinations. On the other hand, in the Asian traditions, there was no exclusivity. <laughs> Religion was something that was an additive or cumulative, if you will. And I find it really interesting. I mean, I'm an individual who is Jewish uh, by, by definition. I'm, I'm Jewish and Buddhist. Well, I, there's a book that just came out recently by a, a Dominican father who is a Zen priest. He's Japanese. He's a Zen priest in Japan, and he's also a Roman Catholic priest. So dealing with the Asian traditions, it's perfectly legitimate to be Jewish and Buddhist or Roman Catholic and Buddhist, theoretically Hindu and Buddhist, or um, uh, Muslim and Buddhist. The Dhammic traditions in general and the Asian and tradition traditions overall learn from each other. That's not to say that there weren't periods of persecution in China or in Korea or Japan, etc. But overall, there was not, if not a sense of harmony, there was a sense of tolerance, but there was also a sense of them learning from each other. We what we look of what we look at as Buddhism today would look very different if it hadn't um, merged with certain aspects of Taoist and Confucian and vernacular. Uh, Chinese tradition, or in Japan, merging the lines between Shinto and Buddhism. I mean, we could go into the whole Honjaku theory that of of which a Shinto uh, assign certain bodhisattvas as Shinto kamis, Shinto spirits, uh, as an example of that process, um, and it works both ways. Next, please. <clears throat> Tiantai, Tendai perspective, and I, I use it that way as opposed to just Tendai because philosophically Tendai is, for the most part, uh, Tiantai, um, the esoteric, the, the form of esoteric practices that we see later uh, occurring um, changed Tendai from Tiantai a bit, but the basic philosophies are, are pretty much the same. And the Tiantai philosophy from the time of Chigi exemplified what we now consider an interfaith perspective, not only by the intertwining of the four Chinese traditions, but also the philosophy itself. It's one, if it is one that sees wisdom as not the sole domain of Tiantai Tendai. And I think that that's another uh, difference that we find in most of the Asian traditions versus the, the European. Um, traditions. I, in a, it's really interesting when you say European because um, it was influenced more by Greek philosophy than by the origin of the of the tradition, whether it was Christian or Jewish. Greek philosophy really is what influenced that that idea uh, to a very large extent. Um, and when we talk about um, not the sole domain, you'll find that those who are not involved in interfaith today are often those who would say, no, I have the only true religion. I have the only true truth. I have the only truth with a capital T. Therefore, I don't need to participate with others. It's not necessary. That's often the, the, the attitude. Um, you'll, you'll find very few um, of fundamentalist religious pr uh, proponents participating in interfaith activities because often they feel that their, their way is the only way. So a Tendai teacher will not insist that there is only one way to attain awakening, and by extension, there are many paths to spiritual realization. Cooperating with different religious traditions becomes sort of second nature. And the reason I, I wanted to state it that way is because 
we, I, I think that, you know, I, I didn't want to go into the whole um, history of interfaith, which I could have done. One of the other points that I could have made in relation to the history of interfaith activity was uh, Nostra Tate, which was the encyclical by the Catholic Church. I believe it was in 1968, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody here who's keen on that, let me know. Uh, I mean, I could check on it, but I think it was 1968. It was it was Pope Paul the 20, uh, Pope uh, John the 23rd, and that's when the Catholic Church said, "Okay, we're wrong. Jesus, uh, the Jews did not kill Jesus, and so therefore we can have a discussion with them." And went on then to have a conversation with, uh, because of Nostra Aetate, having a conversation with um, all the world religions, including Buddhism, um, as being legitimate forms of worship. And we're no, the Catholic Church was no longer going to um, assume that the Jews were bad, aside from the anti-Semitism. The Jews were bad because they didn't really kill Jesus. That was, I mean, I, I know that sounds to us a little bit strange today, but you've got to remember in before 1968, that was a thing. You know, that that's the way it was. I, 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 I Lenny Bruce, by the way, with one of his nightclub acts, I don't know if here people remember or even know of who Lenny Bruce was, but he would come out on the stage and in one of his acts, he would start out with by saying, okay, I'm here. I want to freely admit it. I personally killed Jesus. So get over it. <laughs> it was a bad party. He was a bad cabinet maker. Right. And, yeah. <laughs> Great man. Um, Mr. Tudor was 65. So 65. 65. And Pope Paul the sixth. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. 23rd was a different, was a different set of things. Um, so this is all a way of, of, of saying that, that Tiantai and Tendai has always been open to, I mean, let's face it, if you were in Japan in the night before the 19th century, um, they kept Christians on a couple of, uh, secluded islands yep. out of the way mm -hmm. so that they wouldn't infect the rest of the population. Idea. So the idea of interfaith was, was far from even possible, you know. Um, on the other hand, along comes the Meiji Restoration uh, in the mid 19th century, and now with missionaries flooding Japan because there was a population who had not been um, exposed to that to to a very large extent, with that with a few exceptions of Jesuits uh, in the earlier centuries, in the 15th, 16th centuries. Um, so interfaith really wasn't possible. On the other hand, when you think about the relationship between Shinto and Buddhism, that was certainly there. And when you think about what happened, and, and just to give you an, an idea, the word religion did not exist in the Japanese language until the 19th century. There was no word for religion. And so um, the idea of religion was not even possible. But what I'm saying is that, that Tendai was at the very least open to the possibility once interreligious activities could take place. That's that's what I'm trying to say. Um, okay, next please. I want to say a few thoughts about effective interfaith involvement. And this is about how do we do interfaith in general. Oh, it is the same picture that Jake had, I think. Um, so I'd like to talk about how do we do interact, how do we make interfaith interactions productive? Uh, Le Leonard Swidler is a professor of Catholic thought and interreligious dialogue at Temple University of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania where he has taught since 1966, and he's considered the dean of interreligious inter dialogue thinkers. And you'll find his 10 suggested rules for interfaith dialogue <coughs> on the handout, 
Read them and think about them. We might we might discuss a few of them in a moment. They're a perfect way to start this process. He also set up three guidelines that I want to share and discuss right now. The first one is, well, even before I read the first one, one of the things about um, interfaith and interreligious um, dialogue is one has to have faith before one can be involved in the dialogue. That seems pretty obvious, right? On the other hand, I find it interesting that people who have no faith will also come in and say, well, I believe in all faiths. I don't need whatever tradition it is, I, because I believe in all faiths. Well, that doesn't really work, not, in, not in, in real practical terms. You can be tolerant and you can be um, see the benefit, et cetera, of all faiths. That's not the issue, I, and I think one should. But one, what do you really adhere to? How do you really uh, conduct yourself? That's, that's what we're talking about. And so um, one of the first, and a friend, a friend of mine, uh, Adler, Father Christia Giovanni, <laughs> one of, and we served on several interfaith boards over the years, and one of the things he would always say is, you can't be interfaith if you don't have faith, period. And I, I, I sort of adhere to that. So the first one that you see um, Swidler addressing is, have a good grasp of your own religious tradition. You want them, meaning the other persons in the interfaith dialogue, to know their own faith well so you can learn from them. They probably want the same from you. So in order to have an interfaith dialogue, a true interfaith dialogue, you come from a position of knowing your own faith in order to share so that you can be open to sharing with the other person. It's a two-way process. Second one is come to the dialogue in order to learn and grow, not to change the other. And that is really important. You're not there to convince somebody, oh, your way is the right way. You're there to learn from them what they gained from their tradition and how that could how that could actually assist you in some way. So number three is be willing also to help your own faith community to grow and change. Others' perspectives can aid to show our own blind spots. That's really important. In other words, you see in Swindler's uh, three points here that it's not about trying to change the other. It's not trying to um subvert or any of those things it's really intended for the people to gain a better understanding of each other as a way to grow and also to inform your faith and i think that's what people often miss is that we do interfaith as a way to augment our own faith and our own tradition and that becomes really important and so if we look at the 10 uh, rules for di interfaith dialogue that I printed on the handout, you'll see the very first one is the primary purpose of dialogue is to learn. That is to change and grow in the perception and understanding of reality and then to act accordingly. How many times have you heard me say that Buddhism is a search for the nature of reality? I probably say it at least once every Wednesday. Um, and I think that some people think, oh, that's my thing. Well, Swindler is saying exactly the same thing about traditions, faith traditions in general. And just looking down, I won't, I won't read all of them. But number three, each participant must come to the dialogue with complete honesty and sincerity. But each participant must assume complete honesty and sincerity in the other's partners. And I've been on the Albert Interfaith Board now for over 20 years, probably 24, 25 years, that, that one board. And so it's been, there have been a few members that have come and gone, but the core have been there for that 25 years. That means that we can get things done because we know each other, we trust each other. 
You don't take offense if somebody says something that could theoretically touch somebody off because we know that the person's being as honest and sincere as they can and they're not intending it to be hurtful or anything along those lines. And so the best interfaith dialogue occurs when you get to know the people intimately that you're having the dialogue with and you trust them and they trust you. And part of that trust comes when I remember after um, 9-11, the Muslim community was really being uh, set upon because the, the, more, the larger community thought, oh, it was Muslims, what they did to the World Trade Center. And so we immediately, meaning the interfaith community, we immediately formed a ring around them to protect them. We trusted them, they trusted us. Now, if there's an incident at a synagogue, the Muslim community can join together and, and do something in relation to the hate that was conducted at the synagogue. When a year, a year ago, when Ukraine was invaded by Russia, it literally take, took us two days to put together a program at a synagogue in Albany in support of the Ukraine. We've been doing that for the last 20 plus years. So it was very easy for us to say, let's make the telephone calls. Let's get, where's the best place to do this? Well, maybe the synagogue, because they're available that night. They have a big open space. We can screen the, the event, etc. And so that's what we did. That's really what it takes. So it's really a form of sincerity and honesty and trust that forms between members of the interfaith uh, dialogue. Um, number six is really important. Each participant must, must come to the dialogue with no hard and fast assumptions as to points of disagreement. We're not sitting around and saying, oh, you know, you know what those Muslims believe? Well, that's nonsense. You've already made up your mind. You have to enter into it with saying, I don't know. Let me be informed by what they, how they interpret that. I remember, um, this is going back probably five or six years ago, someone had, had said to me, they didn't understand why Muslims are always preaching peace, but then there's the jihad. What is this stuff with the jihad? And this is, of course, post 9-11. And so I went to one of my, my um, Muslim uh, friends, and it was uh, Dr. Bhatti. And I said to uh, Khalid, Khalid, why, you know, when I hear about jihad, the way it's listed in the Quran, it means this which has to do with, with really um, practice. It has to do with, with, with devoting yourself to a particular set of practices. That's the meaning of jihad in the Quran. How did it really begin? How, why are these people in um, Iran or Iraq or wherever using the term jihad in the way that they're using it? Well, he didn't take offense at that. And he informed me that it was a result of colonization. The term jihad always had the original meaning in the Quran until colonization of those areas of the world meant that the Muslim community had to be militarized in order to fight the, the occupiers. And so one of the ways that they did it was they employed the concept of jihad which is a devotion, a kind of devotional practice. That's not the meaning in the Quran. That's not, not, that's not how it's normally used, but that's how it got subverted by certain groups because of colonization. If, if he had taken offense, I never would have understood that. And so I was able to go back and tell my friend, well, here's how this got, here's how this was changed. Um, Number seven, dialogue can take place only between equals. 
And number the, the, the last two, I think, are really good. Number nine, persons entering into interreligious dialogue must at least minimally be self-critical of both themselves and their own tradition. Never go into it saying, look what I got and you don't. That's really what it comes down to. And number 10, each participant eventually must attempt to experience the partner's religion from within. It's not enough to look at how, to look at it in a superficial fashion. It's really necessary to look at the other tradition from how they see it. In, in anthropology, we have two terms which you may or may not know, emic and edic. Emic is referring to when an anthropologist is looking at another culture. Emic is looking at the way the other culture views their culture. And edict is the way the, the impartial, quote unquote impartial, observer are looking at that culture. One is looking at it from a social science perspective, that's edict, and the emic is what does the person who's practicing that, what, what do they believe about their own culture? And so what this is really saying is to attempt to experience the partner's religion from within is to understand their viewpoint as they see it, not as an objective like social scientist who would look at, the, at that situation. Next, please. In conclusion, Last month and over the next few months, there are a number of interfaith and interreligious activities and events taking place. And I thought that this would be a good time to have this discussion. That's why I went through what is productive interfaith dialogue. Um, as you know, if you read the Shingi, I had attended the Hizmet conference last month. Though Hizmet is a Muslim organization, its activities are interfaith and the recipients of their generosity and organiz organizing come from all faiths with no attempt to proselytize. I won't go further into this, assuming that you read the Shingi, uh, but you might have some other questions about it. And if you haven't read the Shingi, go read the Shingi! <laughs> but you can ask some questions about the Hizmet Conference if you like. On the 21st of March at noontime, there's a day of action in downtown Albany that's an interfaith, it's green faith, uh, action to persuade banks to divest their money in fossil fuels. And again, you can refer to the Shingi for more, more details about that. John wrote a nice little piece in the third jewel about that. In April, there'll be an iftar breaking a fast at the Albany Community Center, which is the Tur Turkish cultural community in Rensselaer, New York. I won't even get into why it's the Albany Community Center, but it's a Turkish cultural center. I some other time. Um, <laughs> anyway, so last year, a number of members of the Turkish community came here and we broke fast here on a Wednesday night. And this year they decided that they would like to have more people from here attend and have um, more people from the Turkish community and then also people from other communities who will be attending. And this is in April. Uh, Ramadan, for those who don't know, is a, basically a month long uh, fast. People fast from sun up till sundown, and then they, um, after sundown, then they they can break fast. Um, and by the way, fasting means nothing goes in the mouth. If you smoke cigarettes, you can't smoke cigarettes. You can't drink water. You can't have anything that's that physically passes your lips during that period of time. And so um, this year. They asked, I, I spoke with Medet, who is the uh, executive director of the center. And so he said that on Saturday the 15th at 7 p.m., we'd like people to join them for Ramadan fasting. And if you like Turkish food, that's the place to be that night. Uh, it's a great opportunity to have Turkish food. And let me know if you'd like to attend, because before that, I'll have to get a count so I can let him know we're going to have you know, 20 people or 50 people or um, the entire town of Chatham is going to join us that <laughs> night, whatever the situation might be. Um, and on the 27th of April in Albany at the Hindu Community Center on Sand Creek Road, 
will be an event called Twisted Symbols, which is an, this is April 27th, which is an examination of the swastika in Asian culture and how it's confused with the Nazi symbol, the Hockenkreuz or hooked cross. And this is part of an interfaith movement to rehabilitate the sacred symbol of light and life, which is the swastika. The program is being sponsored by the Albert Interfaith Lectureship Board, as well as the Hindu community, the Interfaith Alliance of Upstate New York, and the Tendai Buddhist Institute. And so here's an example where, through respect and trust, the Jewish members of the board said, yes, let's do this. We have a rabbi who's going to be coming to do a, who's going to be speaking to what it means to the, the Hakan groups, to what it means to Jewish people, but in dialogue, not in, I'm going to make my points, you make your points. This is a conversation. Which is the <laughs> so that's on the 27th of April. And there's going to be many more opportunities to participate in interfaith activities throughout the year. Please consider attending some of these. I find that when I'm with other people of different faiths working together on issues of common concern, it augments my faith. I always find that there's something to learn and grow from these activities. And the fellowship with other people of faith is inspiring and satisfying, as well as garnering, garnering a feeling of humane solidarity. And I could go so far as to say that Chi Gi and Sideshow would smile upon this. Shakyamuni Buddha himself would find it complimentary to his teaching. Thank you.